North Dakota, including the Master of Science program in ASD and DD studies and Master of Arts program in teaching. Dr. Hefter has been on advisory boards for guidance initiatives and emotional disorders and ASD for the North Dakota Department of Instruction. She has traveled within the US and abroad, sharing her experience and strategies with teachers, parents, and community members. She currently works as an assessment scorer for Pearson Publishing and also presents at professional development events. The latest accomplishment in her work with people with ASD is the topper system of structured teaching. I'll also add that she was my favorite professor in my master's program at Minot State University. So before I hand it over, like our other webinars, this will be recorded. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and there should be time at the end to get them answered. Timing wise, we should be wrapped up by about two o'clock. And in the last few minutes, I'll post the link in the chat to the survey asking for your feedback. Lastly, thank you all for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hefter. Hello, oh, good afternoon. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jacqueline, for um, inviting me here today. Um, I'd like to give out um, a big thank you, big shout out um, to the District Office of Transition Services and this initiative um, uh, for inviting me to share my ideas today. Uh, this webinar initiative has been organized in a wonderful professional development area, and it's a great idea. And thank you to the participants for joining me today. Uh, I know that you've worked hard already this week. Uh, it's Thursday, and um, uh, kudos to you for advancing your skill set and your um, skill level for the sake of our students. So I will go ahead and share my screen right now. Okay, there we go. So today we will review the um, tenets or characteristics of ASD, autism spectrum disorder, and discover how the characteristics can advance or hinder transition or employment goals for a purposeful life. Again, um, thank you. Um, uh, to Anne and um, Jacqueline for um, the nice introduction. Um, this is one of my favorite um, pictures. Um, when I was teaching in St. Martin at a school for um, people with autism, and these were a couple of my little buddies, I, I miss them. And hopefully I'll be able to get back this, this coming January um, to go visit. Um, and um, I will explain a little bit about how I um, develop some programming for these um, students. So um, we'll get started. Uh, what should you expect today? It's going to go really fast. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to talk about ASD characteristics. Um, we're, we will talk about employability skills for all job seekers. Uh, we'll talk about implementing strategies um, to enhance employability or transitioning. Um, we'll talk about um, a few or many um, strategies um, that you can use. And we'll also talk about um, the transition autism planning um, schedule for students. And um, we'll talk about how students can track their own progress. And we'll hear from a mother um, with, um, Two, she has two um, boys with autism, and then one of them will wrap up our session today and give you um, an idea of how his life um, is going right now. And um, he will also um, let you know about all of the um, 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 successes that he's had. And um, his name is Dakota. So we will um, end with um, his, his um, words. And then I also have um, an advanced organizer for you all. So in the advanced organizer, um, it will give you an idea of um, what we are going to be talking about today. It will give you um, information, all of the links that I have um, um, prepared for you that we won't have time to go uh, over today, but 
please feel free to look at these during our presentation as you see fit and after the presentation. Um, I've given you some templates and some working documents that you can use, um, print, uh, use electronically, and um, the slides will be available to you as well. And then also my, um, my um, bio there. I will put this in the chat screen. So here's the link for the document, the advanced organizer. Okay, back to our PowerPoint. Okay. And I can't seem to get rid of my, <laughs> there we go, there we go. So, okay, as we get started, um, the first part of this, um, session will be pretty heavy because we're going to be focusing on the diagnostic criteria of ASD. And I will give you some insight in what I've seen and the trends that, I, um, that I've seen working with students with ASD. Uh, I started in 1986. And so I've seen a few trends that have um, come and gone. And so the first part will be a little heavy because we'll be talking about the support levels and the criteria and the um, and really it's going to look like a deficit view. Um, and then the second part, it, we were going to be focusing on the unique uh, positive traits or neurodiversity of our students with ASD and pairing those characteristics with strategies that enhance their success. Okay, before I do the diagnostic criteria, I would like to launch a poll um, just so I see um, who I'm, you know, get, get a feel of, of um, the audience. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll and I'm going to ask you how many students with ASD do you currently work with? Okay, and as the, the poll is coming in, I'm seeing, okay, wow. Okay, so 43% um, of you work with one to 10 and 34% work with 21 and over. So you know, <laughs> you know what you're working with today. So what I, uh, one goal for uh, me today is for you to choose one or two of your students um, and, or um, just one or two of the students that you work with right now. And I would like you to um, at least choose one or two of the um, strategies that I, I am going to give to you today and implement them in the next week. Because we know when we, we go through workshopping or um, uh, sessions like this, professional development, sometimes we, um, we close our computer and go off and we don't share the information or we don't apply the information right away. And so we, it gets lost. But in the next week, I would like you to just try to implement one of the strategies that we give out today, um, just so that it stays fresh and current for you. Okay, so the uh, DSM-5 criteria for ASD, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, um, tells us uh, and gives us the characteristics um, and the features of autism. I've been diagnosing um, students, adults, children, youth um, with the um, ADOS too. And I've been doing it for about mm, close to 20 years now. And so I'm going to fill in the kind of the, the blanks that maybe the um, diagnostic, the DSM-5 kind of missed out on, but we will go ahead and um, um, talk about these right now. And you also have a link. Okay, so we're looking at um, the, um, the criteria for ASD. So our core criteria 
are social communicative impairments and restrictive and repetitive behaviors. So those are the two core dimensions of autism. And looking back at um, some of the trends that I've seen um, from my three decades of working with kids with autism and youth adults with autism, in the 80s and early 90s, it was more of a, a medical model or a clinical view of autism. So um, we rarely saw anyone with autism in our schools, you know, because they were misdiagnosed as people with intellectual disabilities um, because of some of the traits that they, they had. So they were misdiagnosed um, as having uh, other developmental disabilities you know, in, in the 80s and the 90s in the school system. And then in 1994, um, ASD was finally acknowledged um, in our um, idea or our, our law governing um, special education. So that was in 1994. And at that time, it was PDD, so pervasive developmental disabilities. And after 1994, you know, guess what happened? So we started seeing a skyrocketing amount of students with autism because we finally had a category for them in our educational system. And then in 2003, around 2003, another trend came into play where um, school districts could diagnose or give an educational diagnosis of autism within their school team. So they use the school team um, and their wisdom to diagnose um, ASD. And they had to have on that team someone with um, you know, a professional background in ASD. So we did have an educational um, diagnosis. We still do. Some school districts opt out of that. Um, some school districts go with the educational team. And um, just moving forward then, the next trend was would be um, in 2013, 14, 15, they started um, uh, revising the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and they came out with the DSM-5. And within that, they another trend that they had was then, they talked about the neurodiversity of ASD or the um, many um, points of the spectrum that students can can belong to. And um, so we got rid of the Asperger's um, identification indicator. And now we're just looking at the spectrum. Okay. So those are the trends that I've seen within our, um, uh, the, the characteristics or the, the diagnostic characteristics of, of autism. So, okay, let's get back and talk about the social communicative impairment. And so we're, we're talking about deficits in social emotional reciprocity. So ranging from abnormal social approaches and failure of uh, normal let back and forth conversation, um, reduced sharing of interests and emotions with people, um, uh, lack of initiating or responding to social interactions uh, with others. Um, another deficit view we're looking at is um, Nonverbal communication um, uh, used in social interaction, ranging, for example, poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication, uh, abnormalities in eye contact, body language, deficits in the use of um, gestures or lack thereof, gestures and facial expressions, and nonverbal communication, and deficits in maintaining and understanding relationships, um, ranging from um, difficulty adjusting behavior to suit other you know, social um, contexts, to difficulties in sharing uh, in imaginative play or making friends or understanding friends. And another thing that I would add here is um, the, the topic of theory of mind or mind blindness. So this um, falls into the deficits in developing and maintaining uh, relationships. So we're talking about um, theory of mind or the ability to attribute uh, uh, mental states like um, to ourselves and others serving as one of the, I guess, foundational elements for social interaction. So having a theory of mind is important. Um, because it provides, I guess, the ability to predict and interpret the behavior of others. So, you know, that's a, that's a big part of our, our life there. Um, 
interpreting the behavior of others. And when, they're, when um, they show um, the attribute of mind blindness, um, this is not recognizing that others have different thoughts, feelings, ideas, likes, you know, other than the person with ASD or themselves. So, you know, one, one example would be when I was um, in um, clinic and I was um, diagnosing this six-year-old, um, he was telling me that his birthday party was coming up and he said he was going to have, um, you know, um, I guess at the time it was um, SpongeBob um, that was his special interest. And so SpongeBob, he was going to have a SpongeBob cake and, and napkins. And, you know, it, it was his, it was his special interest. So he was talking away and he was very verbal. And now I tried to um, interject myself to see if I can get into his world. And, you know, when he was talking about this, I stopped him and I said, oh, I, I just had a birthday. And he looked at me with a blank stare and said, did you have SpongeBob cake? And did you have SpongeBob napkins? And, and I'm like, no, I, you know, I had, you know, just a plain cake with, with flowers on it. Oh, you didn't have SpongeBob wrapping paper? And, uh, no, I didn't, you know? And then, and then he went on to explain that he was going to get a puppy for his birthday or he had gotten a puppy and, and he was talking about the puppy he had, he was trying to find a SpongeBob collar for his puppy. And, and, and still I'm trying to interject into his world. I'm trying to pull him into my world. I'm trying to um, get into his world. And, and I said to him, oh, I had a puppy. Yeah, he, he passed away a, a year ago. I had him for about 13 years. Um, yeah, and he looked at me and, and he couldn't get into my world. He still talked about his puppy and his you know, and SpongeBob. So that's that's an example of mind blindness, not being able to hop into their world, and um, vice versa. Um, other criteria that we look at look at are um, some symptoms. They they can be present um, in our developmental period, meaning um, infancy up to age eighteen. Um, we can also use historical data or historical um, uh, markings um, for help in um, meeting criteria. So if a student at age three used to um, do some stereotypical behaviors, banging his head, and he doesn't so much do it now, you can still use that information as um, criteria to back up your diagnosis. So that, that's another change that they, they um, added to the DSM-5. Um, you know, symptoms have to cause clinically significant impairment in social, you know, occupational or other important areas of current functioning. So uh, I tell my, my um, college students uh, or people that I'm training, I let them know that um, because you have autism doesn't mean that you have a disability, okay? So when we're looking at a disability, we say that you have a disability if it impacts your daily life in a negative way. So if it impacts your life in a negative way and it's um, uh, inhibiting you to socially you know, interact with others, um, to hold down a job, to uh, be healthy and to protect yourself. If, it, if that's the case, then it's a disability because it's impacting your everyday life and your current functioning. But if it's not, so if, um, for example, my brother um, had high, high functioning um, autism, he was a, an electrical engineer he was very successful. He you know, didn't like being around people very much, but when you're an electrical engineer, you can sit in your little, your, your office and you can do your thing and you don't really have to talk to anybody. So he, yes, he had autism. Did he have to be in an IEP? Did he have to be on a 504 uh, accommodation plan? Maybe he could have been on a 504 in high school, but he, did not have a disability because it wasn't really impacting his adult life at the time. So that's just an example. So, um, and then exclusionary causes, um, these disturbances are not better explained with the intellectual um, disability or global developmental delay. 
Another thing that um, we included in DSM-5 were support systems. So how important are support systems? If we don't locate and understand um, the proper resources, our students are stressed out, well, you know, let's just face it. So um, um, we talk about the, the severity level. So we will talk about that in a little bit, but I also wanna to talk to you about the um, documented dual diagnosis or comorbid um, conditions that can come along with autism. Um, autism never stands alone. <laughs> it has always has a, a partner. So either ADHD, anxiety disorder, you know, um, sensory processing disorder, um, uh, some kind of seizure disorders, um, you know, bipolar disorder, de depression. So it all, you know, autism does not stand alone. It, it has some, it always has something um, um, carrying along with it. And um, we talked about the, um, the levels of um, support that we have. And this is where we talk about Okay, high functioning, are we talking about classic autism, classic ASD, you know, where this is where the spectrum comes in. And this is a lovely feature for educational settings because it can clearly delineate where the student needs support. Do they need support in social communication and interaction? Do they need help in the restrictive repetitive disorder? Okay, and I didn't talk, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I didn't talk about the restrictive and repetitive behaviors. Um, you know, um, they are the stereotyped or repetitive motor movements um, using objects, um, simple motor stereotypes, um, lining up toys, flipping objects, echolalia, idiosyncratic phrases. Um, so that's another um, core criteria with that. Um, insistence of sameness. Um, does it cause distress? Does it cause distress to the, the person and their family and their surroundings? If, if something gets changed in their life um, from day to day, it can be extreme distress, um, difficulties with transition and rigid thinking and patterns, um, thinking patterns. Um, there could be uh, greeting rituals that they have, uh, need to take the same route to school every day or to Walmart. Or, or to target every day. And if you change that course, then you know, your life is disrupted. Um, and then, um, then they have the highly restrictive fixation for um, interests or focus. So I call it special interests. So strong attachment um, or preoccupations um, with objects or, or um, events or, or interests. So, um, um, another thing is the hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. And that's another DSM-5 um, um, addition. And um, they talk about the sensory aspects of, of autism, which we all know so well um, with, um, especially for those of you working with a, um, a large population, you see different sensory interests, I'm sure. Um, sensory um, um, sensory um, input um, in differences like um, to pain and temperature and adverse um, responses um, to noises and smells and um, things like that. Okay, so those are the restrictive and repetitive behaviors that we talk about. Um, I'll let you go ahead and take a look at those um, right now. And um, the appropriately targeted support levels, I, I think is also attached um, to the um, document that I gave you a link for. So we're looking at um, level three. Level three as being the requiring um, very substantial support. So we're talking about student with significant autism, ASD. So, um, they can have a level three in social communication aspects, and they can have a level one in behavior. You know, that's where our, our spectrum comes into play. And then level two is that um, maybe moderate level of, of autism. They still have marked um, de deficits in verbal and nonverbal social communication skills. 
um, and they still see the inflexibility in behavior, um, but that it considered moderate um, level of on the spectrum. And then, and then we're looking at level one, which would be considered high functioning area and um, with some supports um, and requiring some supports, uh, maybe um, um, not so much a, a, a teacher assistant with them all day long, but uh, maybe on a um, consultant basis with, um, with the IEP team. So, you know, it, with my opinion, this um, the supportive level that they they um, introduced in DSM five that that was just the the ticket to understanding autism and and um, getting help, um, getting the right um, the right and appropriate um, support levels. Okay, so we are um, moving into. Okay, so we're kind of moving out of the deficit view of autism, you know, the, the um, deficits in social communication and restrictive um, repetitive behaviors. Okay, so now we know all of those characteristics of autism, which you all know very well. Now I want to transition into um, a more um, um, advantageous um, area or how um, we can focus on the strengths or the positive view of neurodiversity in autism. And, and with that, we're going to connect or pair um, the strategies that um, I have um, brought forth for you today. So we're looking at cognitive strengths um, that will en enhance or advance employability skills or tr um, um, successful transition and retention. So we know that their visual spatial processing is, is um, strong. So um, we all know Temple Grandin and Temple Grandin is a an advocate for autism. She has autism and she has volunteered her brain. So every, I don't know, so often she has a functional MRI um, and it, um, and these um, data points that they gather with these functional MRIs, I don't know if they do it once a year or where, whatever's safe. So they now have um, uh, marked data for decades now um, on her brain. And sure enough, her visual spatial processing center or her syst visual system in her brain is much larger than her auditory system. So there you go. There is um, proof, um, diagnostic proof, uh, medical proof that yes, um, they do respond to visual um, processing. Um, uh, they have excellent rote memory. They, um, they have that prolonged attention in areas of strong interests or special interests that can be a strength. We'll talk about that with some of our um, strategies. Um, their awareness of detail is um, quite um, <laughs> remarkable sometimes and um, their long-term memory um, can be very strong. Their ability to think outside the box is another strength. You know, capturing the positive of neurodiversity, um, you know, their attention to detail, their deep focus, their observational skills, um, they absorb and, and can retain facts. They have that expertise in their special interests. They have a very methodical approach to things. They're very systematic, they're systemizers. You know, if we see adults with higher functioning um, autism with um, average to above average IQ into, you know, a, high, um, like high IQ areas. Um, we look at, um, we look at that, those, um, that population and we um, see a pattern there and, and we see that they're very methodical and they're systemizers where they're going to be accountants, they're going to be engineers, they're going to be mathematicians, they're going to be um, you know, people that, actuaries, people who work for, um, the um, maybe the insurance companies. So they're systemizers is how I like to um, 
coined the phrase. So systemizers with meta, um, methodical approaches. And then, you know, back to my brother, he was a systemizer, he was an engineer, but then he lacked that social component. So, um, okay, so novel approaches, you know, they can, they can come up with a different idea that maybe I don't didn't think of. Um, their creativity can be outstanding. They have tenacity and resilience and and then um, you know they they can learn how to accept the differences and diversity um, and and they have um, a high level of integrity um, for the most part. Um, for instance, I worked with a student um, and he was in a science Olympiad team. He was on a um, this team and they went to science competitions and uh, one question was a, a, a question on evolution and biology uh, uh, you know the um, study in biology about um, evolution and how uh, one theory is uh, you know, that we have evolved throughout millions of years into the people we are now and because he had such a, a high level in, of integrity with, with his religious views, he walked out of the Science Olympiad um, competition because he couldn't understand why someone would talk about evolution um, and he had the Christian, the Christian view. So there we go again with the mind blindness and, and not understanding that other people can have thoughts and theories. And um, he, he had his um, his own integrity, you know, that he wanted to up uphold. So that's just an example of um, the differences or the neurodiversity of, of ASD. And I know we could probably add many, many more, but um, because of um, um, our time session today, um, you know, we could we could add more, but we'll just um, move on to. Um, pairing um, these neurodiversity um, markers and to, to talk about what, how can we make them successful? How can we make our students successful and um, gainfully employed? You know, that, that's our goal, right? We want our students, we want our children, we want people to be successful, gainfully employed, independent. So these are the, um, these are the things that make up um, a good um, worker or, or employee. So communication, teamwork, reliability, problem solving, organization and planning, initiative, self-management, leadership, mentoring, learning, and technology. So these things, um, these are the tenets for a good worker, okay? So let's roll back to think about, you know, that diagnostic criteria that we covered a few minutes ago. And then let's um, put them together. So the confluence of these would be, oh boy, um, people with autism are going to need a lot of support because all of these tenets of being successful, we need to work on these um, with certain strategies. So employment, employability skills and strategies, we're going to the transition to the next phase. And, and um, with all of the information that we've had in the last few minutes, we're going to put them all together and um, put them in and, and put them into perspective of maybe levels of support um, and interject those into the, um, the strategies as well. So yeah, one of the tenets of a good um, employee or a successful per person is communication and problem solving and teamwork. So um, those are important aspects to um, living a successful life. So the strategies that we're going to talk about today very quickly, video self-modeling, story-based interventions, social stories, scripting, power cards, e-power cards, and short stories. And I would like to launch one more poll. I forgot to launch this poll. Um, let's see. Um, I, I need to know what your roles are now. Um, are you considered charter school staff, transition teacher, navigator, administrator in leadership or other? So I'm going to launch the poll. 
I need to know where you all are at um, so that I can address these strategies in a more appropriate way. Okay. Okay, so we're looking at transition teachers. So, okay. Okay, some navigators, some um, administrators. So, okay, so thank you for that. Um, and now I know how to direct most of the this information. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is video self-modeling. And video self-modeling involves a person watching a video or, or of himself, herself, successfully engaging in a behavior and then imitating that behavior. And we call that um, feed forwarding. And there are two types of video modeling. There are video self-modeling where the person um, watches a video of themselves successfully engaging in the behavior and it can, um, excuse me, it combines their strengths of visually, visually cute instruction and modeling. And um, it's effective with children and adults um, who, who like watching themselves, you know, in, in their preferred visual learning um, um, mode. Um, they like watching themselves on, on uh, video or on computer. Most, most people like watching themselves. You'll, you'll find some, some people who don't enjoy watching themselves. And so this, this strategy doesn't work very well, <laughs> but uh, most of my clients um, enjoy um, watching themselves. Um, and then there is video modeling, which uses a role model or a person of their age and their gender um, similar to them. So um, they then mimic um, that uh, model. So, but uh, um, research tells us that the most influential and the most um, effective um, type is video self-modeling when our students can watch themselves successfully do a task. So why is this, um, why does this work? Well, it's easy. You can use um, iPhones, iPads, computers. Uh, variety, we, all, we have a variety of camera options and video um, options with editing. And uh, most kids will love it um, from my perspective. Um, gives uh, kids a chance to practice their social skills. And for positive self-review can leave, um, um, they can watch and, and leave the camera um, running and um, they can then um, watch their environment. And so learn about social um, interactions. So um, it depicts positive behaviors. Um, you only want to show positive behaviors. So we never want to see them doing a negative behavior. So if we want um, to put together a video self-modeling um, uh, vignette together, we don't, and if we want to, let's say, uh, a student successfully um, going through um, the cafeteria to sit at a table. So we don't want to video that student neg in negative behaviors like maybe throwing their trays or um, yelling or screaming. So we don't, want, we don't want them to watch themselves in a negative way. Who wants to watch that? No one wants to watch themselves in a negative way. For example, quickly, at my wedding rehearsal, I slipped down the... the the stairs uh, at the altar. So, and it was being videoed. So do you think that I wanna go back and watch that? No, don't wanna do that. So, um, okay, so we wanted to depict positive behaviors. Uh, we want to select developmentally, developmentally appropriate behaviors. Uh, we wanna keep the vignette or the video self-modeling vignette down to five minutes, two or three minutes is best. You want to ensure confidentiality of the videos, make sure um, guardians or parents give permission to um, use video and uh, of course get informed consent and make the in, in entire process fun. So we'll talk about this. So this is just like a quick um, 
startup on how to use video self-modeling. So you wanna choose a target behavior, keep it discreet, keep the behavior discreet, one behavior at a time, use techniques to increase the likelihood of the behavior, such as some of the um, strategies that we're going to talk about later. And we want to um, use prompts. The next step would be set up a situation that will induce the behavior. So we wanna use prompts. Are we going to use gestural prompts? Are we going to use verbal prompts? Are we going to use hand over hand prompts? You know, what? how are we going to um, use those prompts? Uh, one um, suggestion is to keep the prompting very light um, because you're going to have to edit out the prompt the prompts. So as you see in the next video or the upcoming video, you'll see how we took out the prompts. Props. So, um, <clears throat> so then you video the situation or behavior with the prompts to get a positive um, depiction of the behavior. Edit all extraneous activities, prompts, and subjects. So the student is just seeing himself, herself doing an activity correctly. Um, present the video on a device. Um, sometimes you can use a checklist or evaluation if needed, so the student can check off and make sure that they they watch themselves. Uh, they're they're identifying the correct behaviors and then see if it works. Sometimes it's like anything. You know, you're going to have to edit and try things over and over. So, you know, see if it works. So. Um, we talked about feed forwarding and that it's rapid teaching and feed forwarding provides that information images um, that one can do in the future and they can see themselves being successful. So feed forwarding um, is a technique in the behavioral realm um, where um, they, they advance themselves and see themselves doing something positive. Okay, so this is an example, a video of um, our little guy here. And he, um, this is where they're setting up the prompts and the situation um, to elicit positive behavior. So let's see. Can you walk over to the desk? Walk over to the desk. Okay. <laughs> Can you walk over to the desk? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Right here. Come stand right here. Right here. Okay. Now look at look at her. Look at the librarian and say, "I need help." I need help. What kind of help do you need? Say, "I want." I want to to check out check out a book. A book. Okay, and then. Okay, then we took out all the prompts and this is what we get. I need help. What help do you need? I want to check out a book. Okay, so you see that all the prompts are taken out and, and the student is um, um, successfully completing his, um, his task. I've given you some apps for video self-modeling and it's very nice now that all of our um, computers come with uh, editing, um, video editing, um, camera, camera editing. And so it, it's very um, easy to clip out and edit um, these short vignettes um, for success. So here are some apps. I think I have them on your advanced organizer um, as well. So go ahead and take a look at those. And um, it's something, you know, video self-modeling is something that I have been um, using for, for many years. So, um, okay. Okay, then we talk about story-based strategies. You know, this is another evidence-based strategy um, that we have. Um, Evidence-based, you know, I talk about evidence-based because, um, you know, someone else has done the work for you, okay? So all of these strategies that I'm giving you today are evidence-based. You don't have to collect data. You don't have to figure out if, if it'll work. For the majority 
of the of the population with ASD, these are strategies that have worked within that population. So people have done the work for you. So <laughs> social stories, power cards, cartooning, social autopsies, scripting, short stories, storyboards, they're all considered story-based strategies that you can use with video um, self-modeling to prime them for the video, to help them um, use the the video in in um to the best of its ability you know we want to engage power cards and cartooning and scripting so that it will fortify that video self-modeling i always say that video self-modeling if i have a tool chest um a toolbox video self-modeling is my power tool that i go to and the rest of these are you know the the other tools in my my toolbox so they will um help to um, um enhance the likelihood that the that the student will be successful so um you'll probably use social stories you know how common are social stories it's very so very common carol gray have to give her credit for those um you know you write story in first person um I see that people are raising their hands and I'm not able to um, access. Yeah, that. I think we should, I think we'll save que save questions for the end or, or put them in the chat box if you don't want to forget what okay. your question was. And then at the end, we'll answer questions. I'm seeing the hands. Oh, perfect. So, okay, thank you. That. Thank you. Okay, um, so social stories, I've given you um, the delineation of how to set up a social story, um, what it should look like, um, I've given you an example of a social story here. Um, because of time, we're just going to kind of um, um, roll through this. Um, and uh, in a social story, we want directive sentences. These describe the responses to the child um, or the, the student or adult um, should make and, um, and complete to complete the activity, the behavior the child should exhibit. We always wanna say what they should exhibit. We don't wanna say, um, for instance, if a student is pulling hair, you don't wanna put in the social story, I don't want, I don't pull hair. You don't wanna say that. You want to say, I want to keep my hands to myself. Don't, you know, don't bring up that negative behavior because the minute you do, they're going to react to that. So you'll also want a control sentence. The child usually writes these sentences and they are strategies to remind them about the social stories information. So um, here are a couple examples of social stories using um, pictures. Sometimes I feel frustrated or upset. It's okay to feel frustrated. You know, they're using those directive sentences like sometimes um, um, because uh, things aren't always, you know, 100% of the time. Uh, so using the terms as um, terms sometimes helps. Um, descriptive sentences, like I said, sometimes, usually once in a while, use a perspective perspective sentence. Um, these describe how other people feel and how they react to that. So here's a little cheat sheet for you. Have the title and you can go ahead and, and put in your own information and um, come up with your own social story. I also have a link to social stories on your advanced behavior or advanced, advanced organizer. Um, uh, another one that I use, strategy that I use to help video self-modeling is a visual strategy called cartooning, where you use um, the stick figures or drawings and thought bubbles to portray maybe um, uh, an incident where the student um, has mind blindness and you're trying to explain how other people um, think and react to situations. Um, social autopsy, another link for you on your advanced organizer. Um, this is dissecting a social misunderstanding by writing or drawing out the situation from a student's perspective. And what I usually do with a social autopsy, so it usually happens and, you know, comes about, there's a misunderstanding, a mis social misunderstanding. And I usually have, um, if the student can, um, 
you know, draw out what they thought the social situation was. So, um, you know, with with a peer, what what do you think happened? So they're kind of cartooning or using or and dissecting what they thought happened, and then I will also do a social autopsy where I will um, depict and draw out the social situation and then we compare it and then we talk about it. So we're dissecting it and looking at, at things from a different perspective. So that's social autopsy with a link. Um, power card strategy, it, it's a story-based um, strategy that uses a special interest. So all of these, you know, the power card strategy, the, um, the um, social story, you know, we're looking at you know, moderate, you know, all levels of, um, of the spectrum um, can be used. Keep in mind that we want to have it age appropriate um, and we want to use um, their um, special interest um, as well. So pairing those together with the power card strategy. So you're using their special interests with visual aids to teach and reinforce academic, behavioral, or social skills. And I've given you a link to a power um, card strategy. Um, it can be used when an individual lacks um, the understanding of a social expectation um, or um, when you wanna teach a cause and effect between a specific behavior and its consequence, um, to teach perspective, to aid in generalization. It can be a visual reminder because you want to have a picture of the special interest on the power card. And the power card is usually the size of a, a little business card. Um, what are the components of a power card strategy? I've given you the tool um, that you can link to. And an example of a um, power card. Now I send social stories and power cards. I will use email, texting. I will use an e-version. So electronic version of these in most cases for those higher functioning students um, that have um, cell phones that have you know, iPads, so I will send them um, these um, power cards and social stories. Um, so here's an example. So this student that I worked with loved country music. That was a that was their special interest. And so I put a picture of a country singer on the power card, and or I sent this on um, a text or maybe email. So when we go to work at Publix, we greet our coworkers. You will enter Publix through the employee door in the back. Other workers will be getting ready for work or leaving. When they are in the same break room as you, you will say hello or how are you? So using their visual strengths and using their um, special interests, pairing those together to explain a situation. Storyboards is another graphic organizer that you can use to prime um, students for um, uh, tasks. Um, storyboard priming um, is just like cartooning basically, but you're tasking out, you're using a task analysis maybe of, of what will happen at each point. Then we um, look at short stories with pictures. An example here is um, a student in the elevator and using actual pictures, um, positive um, depictions of a task, and then writing captions and um, making you know, some kind of um, story um, uh, book. So um, in this, um, the student says, I don't take the, the train alone yet, but I'm still I'm working on it. So there's a you know positive example. Another example is a social um, interaction with his friends. Um, you know these are kind of affirmation um, stories with pictures. When the rain started to come down, I was okay with it using an affirmation. Um, okay, and there's another example of, of the story um, based pictures. Another. Um, um, thing that I use is scripting, um, and those are the links. Um, and um, I am going to show you the topper that Anne had um, talked about. Um, the topper is 
an organiza organizational tool that's based on structured teaching that uses social stories and scheduling and visual components. And if you go to my website, um, capturingthepositive.com, you have a link on your advanced organizer. If you go ahead and go to my website, and if you go um, to um, my email and you drop me an email, just say hi. I will randomly go through and choose one of you and I will send um, you a topper and its components. So we're running out of time. So I would like you to maybe go to my website and, and watch the short video that I wrote about um, the topper and organizing um, work stations for, for students. Oh, time is just getting away from me. And, and um, Jennifer, so Jennifer, it's okay. It's okay if we go a little bit okay. late. I know we, on our end we got started a little bit late. So if you go okay, over a few minutes, thank that's you, okay Anne. Too. So it's not like thank the recording you. ends here at two o'clock. So. Oh, perfect. Okay, so um, just talking about the the topper, another evidence based strategy that we work with uh, with kids with autism. Our stru is structured teaching where we use visual schedules and we uh, really use task analysis to break down a, a, a task and um, we, we use our, their strength in the visual systems to support um, their tasks. So um, that's the topper um, self-management um, um, strategy that we use um, that I really like are, is the New Skills Academy. Um, it's an educational format or um, um, uh, online learning. Um, they have up to 400 um, classes or courses that a student can take. Now we're looking at the higher functioning students here and um, we are um, looking at um, the New Skills Academy, where you can uh, maybe do some um, career exploration. So there are courses on um, um, makeup application. There are courses in fitness. There are courses in IT. It's about an eighth grade reading level. I did a read uh, readability analysis on it. And the courses are typically about eighth grade reading level. So it's a wide range of courses. You can study anywhere, anytime. You can uh, um, gain qualification. You don't have to have any um, advanced learning. Um, it's just a career exploration that is visually based. Um, they have quizzes. You can get um, certified at the end and it's a multiple choice um, certification exam. And um, it's quite interesting um, going through there, those. Another thing that we can use in our uh, work settings uh, for people with autism is a self-regulation or self-guiding checklist. And I've given you an example of a checklist that um, I used. I used task analysis, another uh, evidence-based um, strategy so we um this person this person okay worked at um um Publix and he had a task of um um stocking shelves and in particular this was this um soup aisle so um he went through and he um can read all of the task components and see if they did it correctly or not. And they can use the, um, the calendar to check off each day. So um, this is a daily progress report using um, the visual strengths of uh, people with ASD and they can self-guide themselves. Another thing, um, um, technology, you know, it, news to you, it's, it's a wonderful website. I've given you links to that and it helps with social uh, interaction and it's also visual based. It comes in, um, it comes in um, advanced levels, um, um, intermediate levels and very basic and advanced. And the example that I have on the screen right here is, is a basic, um, a, um, example. So it would be um, someone who maybe has a minimal reading um, level. So that's another um, um, piece of technology that I use. And then the transaction 
transition action plan for employment success. This is just pulling it all together, putting all of that, your information together. I've given you a link, I've given you a template where you can um, cognitively look and see that the students have all of these um, priming um, um, strategies and which strategies you can use for each of their tasks. Okay, and I'm going to end with a quick um, a video of Dakota. Um, I have been uh, working with him. I, uh, I believe he's 23 and I've been working with him for over 10 years and I've implemented a lot of these strategies with him. He's, he's higher functioning and I just, he just wanted to give a few words. I asked him to um, just talk a little bit about his success and, and how he gets through life just to end our session today. So one. Hello everyone, my name is Dakota Johnson. I was diagnosed with moderate to severe autism when I was 10 years old. And Dr. Efter has asked me to talk about my transitions through life as an example of a success story. Um, this is, unfortunately, this is not a five minute talk. I cannot condense a lifetime of work into five minutes, but I can give you the highlights. So I have gone from high school to college and then now college into the workplace. There are three main things that I have had that have helped me succeed in my transitions. The first, I've always had my thing. You know, everyone always talks about finding your thing. For me, it was more than just a thing, it was an outlet. It has always been sports. I played every sport I could in high school. I played college football in college. And now I still do everything I can to be outside. I don't necessarily play sports anymore because my body is kind of falling apart after so many years, but I still find time to be outside. It is my way of regulating emotions, centering myself, and also a social piece. It also gives me a motivation to do the things that I don't necessarily want to do. Example, school. So the other thing that has always helped me is my ability to adapt. Now, not necessarily how other people would think of as adapting. My adapting has come from everything I've ever done, pretty much, has been therapy. As my mom, Barb Johnson, already talked about with her book, Life is a Stage, everything has been therapy for me. It's been a lot of trial, error, try it again, script it out, everything I can to practice and make every situation therapy. The biggest thing though that I've needed, and this is probably the hardest step and has been the hardest step for a lot of kids, but it has to be the first step. I have accepted that I am different. Living with high functioning autism, you live in, in between worlds. People don't see the disability like they do in someone that's lower functioning. They see someone that should be quote unquote normal, but I will never reach that. And it has took me a while to accept that. And a lot of people try and avoid that, but that is always where it has to start. Parents and teachers always try and avoid letting the child know that they're different because it is a hard step. For me, it almost landed me in prison for others it has almost ended much worse. However, so you can accept and answer the question, why am I so weird? Why am I different? The first things I talk about will never happen because you can't start going up a ladder without that first rung. Thank you for your time. Okay, so that was Dakota and he alluded to um, or talked about his mother, um, Barb Johnson. Uh, she did have a clip um, earlier in the presentation, but because of time, I wasn't able to play it. But it is, um, it will be on my website. I will load it on the website if you would like to go in and look at that at capturingthepositive.com. It is another strategy called scripting that she has written a book on uh, with a fellow um, teacher. Um, educator, and it's just a, um, a wonderful book on how you can use the um, 
much um, the strategy of scripting. So um, looking at that on my website, if you would like. Okay, boy, hour goes fast. Thank you. Um, I would like to go and just, um, you know, we, we talked about a few things, but like I said, my goal for you all today was to take away, you know, one, um, one strategy maybe um, to implement with your stu a student with autism. And um, what I would like to do is just share another poll. I'll launch another poll. Um, just curious, you know, what, just knowing the little um, snippets about each strategy, which one do you think would um, you feel comfortable using? And um, maybe, you know, what, which um, you would like um, more information on. So um, go ahead and I'm going to launch the poll. Thank you so much. Um, my timing, I kind of get off because um, this is my jam. This is my thing. I love talking about the descriptive characteristics of ASD and implementing um, strategies. And um, uh, thank you so much. Okay, a lot of you um, look like um, video self-modeling. Okay, it is. It is a wonderful practice to use. It's very effective. It's fun. Uh, it's engaging. Um, you know, using using uh, the the students as a self as a model is very um, appealing. And um, yes, okay. Oh, Story-based strategies as well. Looks like I bet most of you have used them already. Structure teaching with the topper. Great. Okay. Okay. So I'm ending the poll. Thank you so much. I know there might be some questions and um, I have an email. Um, you have my phone number in, on my website. If you would like um, if you would like to go to my website and find my email uh, address, go ahead and, and send me questions and I will get back to you. And remember to um, email me so you have an, uh, um, a chance at um, getting one of the toppers. And um, it, there is a video on my website explaining the topper in detail. So you get a um, little value added um, video. So thank you so much. Um, Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. And oh. I posted in the link um, or in the chat box that the link to your advanced organizer. So for those of you that were private messaging or asking for um, that link to that advanced organizer, go ahead and grab that in the chat box here. And then that will show up in your Google Drive. So it's a Google Doc. So save it. And then the presenter last week did it. And from here on out, we're hoping that presenters we'll do something similar so that you have a one pager for every one of these seminars. So you can um, save the resources. So I really enjoyed today and I, I love uh, the overview and um, it was a good reminder about some of those strategies. Um, so I think we need, might need a part two. So uh, oh, thanks everybody for being <laughs> here today. And thank you, Jennifer, for sharing all of this important information with us. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. Um, really appreciate the information, Jennifer. Um, it was thank fantastic. You. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this webinar. It will um, end the meeting for everyone. So thank you, hope to see most of you next week. And um, thank you, Anne, for putting this together. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, take care. Bye.